Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coordinating and Managing FTD Care in a Changing World, the first in a series, a special series of AFTD webinars. This series reflects material originally scheduled to be provided during AFTD's 2020 Education Conference. As you well know, we had to cancel the in-person event due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the current environment is having significant impact on people living with FTD, on their care partners, their families, and the health professionals who support them. To that end, we've worked with our conference presenters and sponsors to bring you educational content that we believe can help families manage the FTD journey during this difficult time. I'm Sharon Denny, Senior Director of Programs at AFTD, and on behalf of all of us here and Dr. Pilcher, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you so much. So uh, in a moment, I'll, I'm gonna introduce Jennifer, today's presenter, but before we start, we wanna let you know that this special webinar series is brought to you by the generous support of our 2020 education sponsors. We would especially like to acknowledge our platinum sponsors, Elector, Biogen, Ionis, and Buffalo Trace Distillery, gentlemen of the Pappy Van Winkle Classic. Thank you for making today's webinar possible. We encourage your participation in the event today at two different points in the presentation, and then again at the end, there'll be an opportunity for questions. We ask that you submit any questions you have by typing them into the questions section, which is located towards the bottom of your control panel. Please send those questions as you think of them, and we'll ask as many as possible during the session. Our audience will be muted for the duration of the presentation. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and AFTD's Lauren Godier and Dina Chisholm will try to address them with you. We are recording this presentation and we'll post it on AFTD's website and YouTube channel. Please share it with others that you think may be interested. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Jennifer Pilcher. Dr. Pilcher was awarded her doctoral degree in gerontology from the University of Massachusetts in Boston in 2005. Her professional experience has focused primarily on care and housing arrangements for elders with Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions. In 2018, Dr. Pilcher founded Clear Guidance, a care management practice that specializes in working with clients and families challenged with atypical dementias, including FTD. Prior to founding Clear Guidance, Dr. Pilcher had career-long experience working with people with dementia and their families. She also presently serves as president of the New England Association of Aging Life Care, and is the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Aging Life Care. And so now it is my great pleasure to bring to you um, Dr. Jennifer Pilcher. Thank you so much, Sharon. Okay. Okay. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for that introduce, introduction. I appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge whether you're a care partner or a person living with FTD, that you're already facing a difficult disease and that the added burden of isolation and dealing with COVID-19 has got to be just overwhelming. I'm glad we are all here together to discuss these important issues and share some ideas. When I was putting together this presentation, I chose this format that you can see on my screen because I thought it represented a journey. It looks like a path in the sand that no one has walked on yet and that fades into the distance as um, it blends into the landscape. And I thought this was an apt representation of the uncharted path we are facing with this virus. Most importantly, this path represents a journey that we are all on together. Know that you are not in this alone, and I'm hoping that this program can be one of many ways that you are supported along the way. As Sharon mentioned, I'm a consultant, and I founded a business where I work with people living with FTD, their care partners, and their families. An important key way that we work is to look the worst case scenario in the face, make a plan for it, and then celebrate it if it never comes to pass. Particularly in dealing with COVID-19, it's essential to be prepared to address potential exposure and infection. So today, as you can see in the layout of these slides, 
First, we're going to review what we know about the disease and what to be on the lookout for. Then we're going to discuss how to best protect yourselves. Then we're going to discuss how to plan ahead and what you need to be thinking about to prepare for possible exposure or infection. And lastly, we're going to talk about things to consider that may make quarantine a bit more bearable. Okay, here we go. So first we're gonna talk about what we need to know about this virus. So what we know now, and a lot of this information has been gathered over the weeks that we have been dealing with this disease, is that the symptoms of COVID-19 usually begin as mild. Some people don't accelerate their uh, symptoms at all, and they continue to be mild. Um, for other people, they tend to accelerate within five to seven days of becoming symptomatic. Over 80% of people have fever. Often the initial symptoms are cough, shortness of breath, or loss of taste or smell. There's also some evidence to suggest that some people experience gastrointestinal distress as well. One of the things that's very important to know is whether you have symptoms like this that are related to the virus or not. At this point, you should really um, avoid drugs that fall into the NSAID category, such as Motrin or Aleve, or naproxen or ibuprofen, or their generic names. We know that these medications um, make the symptoms of the disease worse. So if you're questioning whether they could be this, the symptoms of COVID-19, it's important that you avoid these medications. In my house, we've actually thrown them all away just so that nobody can take them by accident. It's a good suggestion that was made to me. Many people who are living with FTD, and particularly those who have PPA, may have difficulty communicating if they're not feeling well. For that reason, it's really important for care partners to be using observation and monitoring for symptoms such as these. So some of my clients, we're actually just taking routine temperatures in the morning. Everybody's taking them and we're journaling those or logging those just to make sure we know what they are and to track any change that might occur. As with um, lots of things um, that affect us, um, infectious processes or even a simple cold, um, it can make a person living with FTD feel um, more confused or disoriented. So this is something to look out for as well. You're really looking for an acute change, not a gradual change. So that's important to mention as well. So those are the symptoms that generally occur that might signal you that an infection is possible. Then we want you to know about what suggests there is a, an emergency or a need to get um, immediate medical attention. And so um, here are the emergency warning signs of what you wanna look for. If you are a care partner or a family member and you have not had confusion before and you begin to have confusion, this is a reason for you or your loved ones to be concerned. If you have difficulty breathing, if you have persistent pain or pressure in your chest, if you have bluish lips or face, which would indicate that you are not getting enough oxygen, um, and it's important also to mention that those with sleep apnea are more at risk. They're not really sure why this is, but it's true. And I know many of my clients with FTD are also living with sleep apnea. So that's something to take into account. And we're also looking for a high fever. So we're looking for an elevated fever somewhere over 100.4. That's when you would start to get really concerned. 
and I'm going to talk about what should you do if you are concerned a little bit later, but this is just to get you familiar with what we're talking about here. Okay. It's important to, there's been some new information and there's a lot of information out there about how transmission occurs. So I always just like to clarify what we know and what we don't know. What we do know is that the infection is transmitted through respiratory droplets. So these are things that come out of your mouth when you're coughing or sneezing. Um, there isn't any evidence yet, at least no conclusive evidence, that this is an airborne illness. Um, and that's, that's really important because there have been a couple of um, articles uh, in the major newspapers over the last few weeks saying that this possibly could be because they were finding some of these droplets in um, the ventilation units in hospitals where people had been treated for COVID-19. And it's important to know that that happened because of things like suctioning or intubating or things that they need to do in those extreme situations. So we don't need to be worried right now about that it being airborne. However, what we do need to be concerned about is that it is obvious that the infection can be transmitted by someone who isn't showing any symptoms. And that is one of the reasons that um, this week, the recommendation has been for everyone to wear masks when they go out in public. And we're gonna talk more about how you can protect yourself as we go along. Okay. So what can you do to protect yourself? How can you reduce your risk of becoming infected? And this is really important stuff. Everybody knows that hand washing is something you need to be doing. But for people who are living with FTD, they may already have difficulty with proper hygiene or may simply not remember to wash their hands. So what we suggest is that you make hand washing part of your daily schedule, you make it something you do together, and you use reminders around the house um, to remind both yourself um, and your family uh, to wash hands. Um, also, you can use hand sanitizer if hand washing is difficult. However, it's important that you don't use a do-it-yourself or a homemade hand sanitizer. Um, the reason for this is that you either can come up with a solution that isn't effective, and therefore you're not actually cleaning the germs off of your skin, or you can come up with something that's too harsh and you can develop a skin condition. So it's important um, if you don't have hand sanitizer, then really focus on the hand washing if you can. Um, I've, I've put a link here and I will be giving out these slides in PDF format afterward for anyone who would like them. This is the CDC guidelines that are actually quite good and this link leads you to both how to avoid infection and what products you need to be using and how often and all of that kind of thing. Um, but also, if you were to become infected, it also has a section on it that says what you should do if you were to become infected and how cleaning might change at that point. So that's an important link. In addition, um, we're really suggesting that you make some pretty serious lifestyle changes. You'll notice there's a picture here of a delivery guy coming awfully close to the woman he's delivering the box to. And so we're suggesting that's not the way we should handle this. Um, as you know, uh, it's suggested that you stay six feet away from anyone else um, at this point. Obviously, all of us, um, I don't know across the country what the expectations are, but here in Massachusetts, all of us have a stay-at-home order. Um, and that really is your best way of preventing uh, being exposed to the virus is by staying at home. One exception is it is okay to get outside and definitely okay to exercise, and we'll come back to that as well. We are encouraging all of our clients to set up deliveries of necessary items. Um, 
this is something that a lot of people have struggled with as it's something they may not be used to and aren't sure how to get deliveries. There are a lot of good uh, services out there. Amazon is one of them. Instacart is another one where they will deliver groceries. Uh, they will deliver pharmaceuticals or things from the pharmacy, toiletries, that kind of thing, and any other kind of supply that you might need. However, it is really important that you sanitize and or quarantine packages if you're accepting them at home. And I've given you a link here to a YouTube video that's done by a medical doctor who talks about what you should do to clean and sanitize groceries and packages after they come into your home. And so I encourage you to watch that because it's good information about how to do that. If you really either don't have delivery available or really find it necessary to go out, make sure that you wear a mask and that you either launder in hot water or dispose of the mask after you use it. We are encouraging all of our clients to cancel all non-essential medical appointments. Most of, in our area here in New England, most of the uh, doctor's offices that are not part of a hospital are closed and not taking appointments, but many of them are doing telehealth appointments. And it's important to know that there have been, a lot of restrictions have been lifted on what they can do on telehealth. So I encourage you to reach out to your doctor if you have an appointment coming up, let them know it's been recommended to you that you not come in. You'll probably be told not to come in and also ask if there is an option for a telehealth appointment, if not. Um, the last resort, if you have to go, and we do have some of our clients, for example, that need Coumadin monitoring, um, and they have to go once a month to have their Coumadin levels checked, and that can't be done at home. We ask you to be very cautious. We ask you to drive up to the doctor's office and then wait outside. Call the doctor's office, let them know you're waiting in your car. Um, we don't recommend going into the waiting room. Uh, wait in your car until they come and get you. Most doctor's offices will comply with this where they'll come out to the door and beckon you in or they'll call you on your phone to tell you it's your turn. You wanna limit your exposure as much as possible. Definitely wanna wear a mask and potentially gloves if you think you're gonna be touching anything in the medical office. And one of the things that um, was sort of surprising to me when I learned it is the importance of staying hydrated. Um, being hydrated gives a boost to your immune system and may very well prevent you from um, getting infected. It's, it's a simple thing, but it really makes a big difference. So something to think about how you can build those things into your daily routine. So, you know, it's important to mention that these changes and restrictions may be difficult to understand or to explain to a person living with FTD. Um, that person may not have the empathy or insight about the need not only to protect ourselves, but protect others around us. Um, and especially for people with PPA, it may be difficult to ask questions um, about what's happening. And there certainly are a lot of questions out there. And this can be incredibly difficult and frustrating and stress producing for both the person living with PPA and the care partner as to how to handle those questions. So we recommend really trying to use simple language, avoiding using too much information. And a really important recommendation is while it's tempting to have the news on 24 seven, as we now have a 24 seven news cycle, um, it's not a great idea for any of us um, as it's a constant reminder of what's happening in our world and know that these news um, stations are having to come up with things to broadcast constantly. Um, and so it is difficult sometimes to know what's opinion and what's fact. So it's really important um, 
to make sure that you're having these discussions and that you're limiting the amount of time you have the news on and you're listening to it. Okay. So I think we wanted to pause there, Sharon, and see if anyone had questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, we're just going to pop in so that you can see us hopefully at the top of your screens. Um, and uh, so, Jennifer, your slides disappeared. I don't know if you want to um, yeah. bring them back up for a second. We'll give, there you go. We'll give a moment to send in any questions they have at this point. So, in terms of learning about the virus and protecting yourself, um, we'll just give it a minute uh, if folks have any thoughts. And actually, I'm inclined to say, why don't we just keep moving ahead? Um, right. Because my guess is that we'll have more questions as you get deeper into the application of things. So we'll, we'll bring back Jennifer's presentation and we'll catch back up with you for questions later. Okay. All right. So what do we need to do to prepare and plan ahead. And I, again, want to make sure that I reiterate that this is a plan that we hope you never have to put into place, but it's always better to be prepared and to have an action plan that you can put into place quickly if you need to. Um, some people do report that the onset of these symptoms can be quite sudden and you may not have the energy or the ability at that point to put together your plan. So we encourage you to do these things ahead of time. And I'm gonna give you quite a bit of information here about how we suggest you plan for this going forward. Okay, so there's an image here of a runner getting ready to start a race. And this is a little bit like how I want you to think about preparing for this time in your life. Um, but it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So first, there probably is a sprint in the beginning, which is how do we get everything together that we need to prepare for this situation? And then we need to slow our pace and relax into um, this isolation that we're living in. And we're gonna talk about how to make a difference um, in that regard as well. So what's the plan for possible infection okay so number one we recommend that you call your primary care provider you remind them of your diagnosis and your living situation if you have a provider coming from the outside to support you you need to make your primary care aware of that as well you want to ask the primary care for their protocol for the reporting of symptoms so what do they want you to do if you have symptoms or your care partner has symptoms? And you want to ask if they have tests available at their office. Um, after doing, uh, oh gosh, I think probably a hundred of these calls in the last couple of weeks, I will tell you that our experience is about half of the doctor's offices actually have tests available and that the answer to that question is changing all the time depending on how many they've had to use. So it's an important thing to know. Um, and to ask your doctor what they would like you to do. Would they like you to go get tested? Would, you, would they like you to call and report your symptoms? How would they like you to go about this? Um, as well, um, you need to start getting familiar with where are the places around you where you can get a test. Um, there are quite a few mobile um, or tented test sites um, in, in our area that are popping up all the time. And in your state, in most states, um, there is a coronavirus task force and for most states, um, the way you access that task force is by dialing 211 on your phone. Now, it, if, you, if that doesn't work from your phone, then you can Google the coronavirus task force specific to your state. And they should be able to give you the information about both where test sites are located 
And as well, there are several hospitals that are dedicated now to serving the needs of, um, of people specifically with COVID-19. So it would be important for you to get familiar with that as well. We also recommend that you get a whole bunch of written information together um, that you collect your healthcare proxy and your advanced directives, the emergency contacts for both of you, whether you're a person living with FTD or a care partner, the list of diagnoses, list of providers, list of medications, and anything else you would want the emergency responders to know. This is important information um, because what we know is if you go by ambulance to the hospital um, with signs of COVID-19, uh, you can't have anyone go with you. So the more information you can have prepared, the better off you will be. As well, you wanna think about how to prepare your home. So you wanna prepare for the possibility that one or both of you might need to quarantine. So you wanna identify a separate bedroom and bathroom that can be used only for the person who's having symptoms or is infected. You need to gather needed supplies, um, such as personal protective equipment, such as masks and gloves. If you can't order masks, which a lot of people are having difficulty doing at this time, there are a lot of people making masks and there are a lot of um, instructional videos on that you can Google um, about how to make yourself a mask as well. Um, and then you want to gather cleaning supplies and disinfectants um, and a lot of those are mentioned on the CDC website that I quoted before. You wanna gather detection and treatment items, okay? So a thermometer is very important. Um, and what they're telling us is if you have mild symptoms, the way to treat it is the same way that you would treat a cold, um, a severe cold, but a cold. So you'll want to use mucinex or some sort of mus mucus reduction medication, making sure that it doesn't have ibuprofen in it, um, that you're using Tylenol, Vicks VapoRub, humidifier, and that you also have extra laundry detergent um, in your home because part of what they recommend is that when you have someone that's infected, you're washing anything they come in contact with in very hot water. Um, so you wanna make sure you've got enough of that on hand. And what you need to do with those emergency instructions and all that information that we talked about in the prior slide is to put them on your refrigerator. This is surprisingly where uh, emergency responders will look for that information. Um, and so that's where it should go. If you're a care partner, um, it's important for you to have a backup plan. If you have a home care provider that is providing service to you now, it's important that you call that provider and find out what their protocols are for caring for an infected person. Um, it is important whether you are infected or a person living with FTD is infected that you know what their protocols might be. So if you as a care partner were to become ill and you quarantined yourself, who's going to take care of you and who's going to take care of the person with FTD? If you're a person with FTD and you're living alone, you need to think about how will you get support if you become symptomatic. Um, and so we encourage you to figure out who will step in if one or both of you get ill. Is there a family member? And you need to have an intentional conversation with that family member about what the plan would be and how it would work. Um, you can contract with a home care agency as a precautionary measure, and I've done this with several of my clients where they've signed a, a contract with a home care agency so that if they need it, they don't have to go through all that red tape at the time that they need it, they can just access it right away. And that agency also knows the particulars of what your needs are and what your home is like and all of that kind of thing. 
There are also um, popping up in New England, and I'm not sure how this is working in the rest of the country, but I assume it's the same in a lot of different places, that there are rehab facilities that are now becoming dedicated to um, housing and taking care of people who have COVID-19. So it would be important for you to know what are those facilities, um, because if your loved one is hospitalized, um, they may need to go somewhere for rehab afterward. Um, there are also some that are setting up isolation rooms for people who have mild symptoms. So that's another thing to spend some time looking into. And then you want to identify who's the person who will be responsible and educate them about where to find the emergency information in your home so that they're not searching for that. It's also a very good time for everyone um, to have a discussion about your advanced directives and to ask yourself, does it still apply given this environment? Uh, there is a wonderful organization called Honoring Choices, and I gave you here the link to Honoring Choices in Massachusetts. Um, and they have a great toolkit that just has some general suggestions. If you don't have advanced directives or you don't have what's called a personal directive, in our state, uh, those things are not legally binding. Sometimes it's also called a living will. Uh, those things are not legally binding, but they can help um, with people making decisions for you if you're unable to make decisions. And so I've given you that link here, but I also encourage you to Google honoring choices in your state. I believe most states have a division of honoring choices and they give you um, some of the things to think about and some of the documents that you can use for that if that's something you haven't yet prepared. Okay. Sharon, did we want to take questions again here or? You know what, I'm going to suggest that you just keep moving along because I think that the um, conversation will continue to drill down into the practicals that people are thinking about and we'll have questions, time for questions at the end. Great, okay. Okay, so what are our suggestions in terms of what you could consider doing um, to make being quarantined or being isolated in your home a little more manageable. Um, and so I'm gonna talk you through some of the things that I've worked on with our clients here in New England. So one of the most important things is to set up a routine and a structure uh, in your home. And I'm sure there are some of you out there that are also trying to homeschool your children or deal with children in the home. And so setting this up, this kind of routine and structure, and structure can help everybody in the family, um, not only to know what's coming up and to have sort of a bio rhythm of the day that everyone can adjust to, but also um, to make sure things are getting done. Uh, I think there is a, um, a tendency when you're in your home all the time to sort of forget about the, the, the fact that usually you have sort of a schedule of when you get things done around your home. And this is a really good opportunity for you to do home improvement um, or just keep your, um, your living environment neat and tidy. So um this is an example of a routine and a structure um, that you might use um, and you will notice that we really have a, a set bedtime in this kind of schedule and i think that's really important um, i know that when you're sort of dragging through the day and there's not a lot of structure it's easy to let bedtime get later and later and what we know is that consistent sleep can help combat anxiety and depression, um, which are things all of us are feeling at this moment. And so using a regular sleep pattern will help you to avoid some of those things as well. Um, you'll notice that I've worked hand washing into the schedule as well. It's important that you have 
vigorous exercise and periods of real exercise or real intellectual um, stimulation. And also you work into downtime into your day as well. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about stress relief and that might be some of the time that you spend doing that. Um, really important that you have downtime for about an hour before you go to sleep, but that that does not involve a phone, an iPad, or a TV, so that you're really putting your brain to rest at the end of that day. Um, and there's a lot of studies out there that that can be very helpful in establishing a regular bedtime as well. Things to avoid. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we have a tendency when we're home all day to just sit in front of the television. And then I think um, one of the, they did a study recently, I can't remember where it was out of, where they talked about how hours and hours of television sort of lulls your brain into low activity, which is not good. So you end up being entertained, but you can end up feeling more restless after hours and hours of television. So I think it's important to not necessarily get rid of television altogether, but to think about where it's appropriate during your day and to think about um, what kinds of programs are gonna help you with stress rather than exacerbate your stress. While it's important to stay informed, it's also overwhelming the amount of news that is coming at us, uh, whether that is over your phone or online or a newspaper or on television. And so while I appreciate you need to stay informed and involved, set times for doing that during your day and the rest of the day, see if you can put your focus elsewhere. This will definitely help with um, stress and anxiety during this time. It's also true, um, I know many of my friends have talked about this phenomenon that every night feels like a weekend when you don't have to get up and go to work the next day as early as you normally would. And so there's a tendency, I think, to lean toward um, falling into habits like having more than one glass of wine and, and that kind of thing. So it's really important to pay attention to limiting this not only because it can disrupt your sleep pattern, which is essential for overall health and immune system um, and uh, good mental health, but also um, because while it may make you feel better in the moment, it actually can make you feel more irritable uh, later on. So I think that's an important thing to pay attention to and, and just keep checking ourselves on. I've given you some resources here that I thought might be helpful. If you haven't start, started Zoom calling or FaceTiming with your family members, now is the time to do it. Um, I can tell you that a lot of joy has come from just seeing other people's faces in my family and lots of other families around me. Um, and so I've given you a link here. Um, with a simple explanation of how to get on Zoom and FaceTime if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, FaceTime allows you to call from an Apple phone one-on-one. -on -one. Zoom allows you to have more people join, so it really can feel like, um, like a virtual party. I've also given you two links here about activity ideas. A lot of places are doing online concerts, online museum tours, online zoo tours. It's really amazing what has come about over the last few weeks. So I've given you some examples here of people who've compiled lists of things that might be helpful, but also just get on Google and, and, um, and search your interest and you may very well find that there are more things online than you realized. Um, I really recommend this app called Calm, and you can find this on the Google and the App Store. And even for those of you that are saying, I don't really like meditation, or I don't know how to do it, I'm not good at it, this is a very simple, easy to follow program. It can go on your phone. You can do as little as five minutes. You can listen to a story or a lead meditation or just, um, 
white noise or the noise of waves crashing. And there's a lot of research that even if you only take five minutes out of your day to do that, it's going to make a difference. And so I encourage you to utilize that app um, because it's an easy way to access those resources. I also think for all of you out there, it's important to be as self-reflective and aware of the tension that we're all feeling as we possibly can. It's important for us to acknowledge to each other that we have a heightened sense of anxiety and how that might play out for you um, and, and to talk about those feelings. It's important for us, particularly care partners, to be aware of body language and facial expression, to make sure that when you're entering into a difficult conversation or a conversation where you need to share information, that you've prepared yourself for that conversation um, so that you don't project any more stress or tension into the situation. It's very important to validate each other's feelings. Um, sometimes we skip this step often with each other um, in talking about, we wanna solve problems. We wanna get to the bottom of what's bothering somebody or fix it. And often we forget the very simple step of just saying, I hear you. I see you're angry. I see you're upset. Um, I see you're confused. Um, and just, just make that statement and then wait, and that's the hard part. Wait for the person to speak about how they're feeling. And sometimes this all by itself can diffuse uh, some of the tension that you're all feeling. Acknowledge and accept that you're each going to have breakdowns. It's just impossible not to. Um, I can tell you that it, with all of my clients I've spoken to, They've all expressed, I'm crying in the bathroom. I, I, you know, I don't know what to do. It's driving me crazy. This feels like Groundhog Day. Those are all acceptable feelings for all of us. And we need to be able to uh, express those and um, accept that they're just part of the process. If communication is difficult for either one of you, agree to take a break. We know a lot about neuroscience and how your adrenal reaction um, can occur when you get angry or upset, and it really can affect how you're thinking or your ability to rationalize. So if you find yourself in that situation, try to agree to take a break and take a break for at least 15 minutes, and then you can try the conversation again. Um, and I've had a lot of success with clients in working through that kind of agreement. And lastly, I would uh, recommend, I've actually started this practice myself and found it to be extremely helpful in changing your state of mind, is to practice gratitude. So I've worked with a lot of my clients when they wake up first thing in the morning to think about what they're grateful for. And then at the end of the day to talk about what was I grateful for today? There's so much focus on the negative right now for all of us. And there is some evidence to suggest that the more you practice gratitude, the more you can actually change your brain into seeing things you're grateful for and noticing more of the positive aspects just by practicing being grateful. So I encourage you to, to do that as well. Okay. So we've reached the end of the um, formal presentation, and now we will take any questions that folks might have, either about what's been presented, or if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, so we're going to switch on webcam, so hopefully you can see us as we're responding to the questions that you've sent in. and. Um, we, we have a variety of questions and, you know, it's really interesting to me. I think you started by saying how important it is to almost think about the worst case scenario and then learn and prepare and become ready. 
And to me, what that says is we're really arming people to be able to advocate for what they need. And if it's one thing that we know is true for folks in the FTD community, it's that they learn how to advocate um, and need those skills. And I think what you're challenging us to do today is to think about how do we apply those advocacy skills in a, uh, really it's an unprecedented situation for most people to be thinking in the terms that we are now. Absolutely. So there's questions about advocacy, I think, and at least I would sort of put them into that category. And one is related to insurance coverage. So um, what's the best way to figure out what your insurance will cover in these times? And are there, uh, is there anything different about interacting with insurance companies around some of the things people may need now? Right. I think um, the good, this is actually some good news, is that um, insurance companies are covering a lot of uh, the care that you would need under COVID-19. They are covering telehealth um, appointments that you make with your doctor. So, so they're I haven't heard from any of my clients that they've had difficulty navigating the insurance industry and getting things covered. Uh, we're in an unprecedented time here for sure. And we've heard a lot of promises from our government that no one will be turned away for treatment and that things will be expanded uh, to include specific treatments that you might need. I think an important thing to look into is if you have a deductible, what would that look like if one or the other of you were hospitalized? Um, if you need the ICU, it's expensive no matter how you cut it, but usually those things are covered after a certain amount of time. It's your deductible that's really going to be an issue. So you might want to talk with your insurance company about how much of your deductible have you spent down it's usually based on the calendar year, so it's likely you haven't spent a lot of your deductible already this year. So preparing yourself to know what those costs might be um, for you. Um, but I, I don't, I haven't heard anyone's getting turned away because of insurance. Uh, if you're uninsured, that's an important thing that you need to think about right away and to look into whether you're. Um, whether your state has a program that you can sign up for. I've also heard that the federal government was going to open up Obamacare um, for enrollment on a temporary basis. And I know that's been done in some states, but not all. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Um, you had some really good suggestions around being proactive and working with home care providers. So before there's difficulties that come up, and one of the questions that was sent in was, how do you know that a caregiver that you've hired doesn't have the virus when they're coming into your home? Can you insist that they be tested? Um, and with everything that we hear about the availability of testing, do you ha have you had experience in your area that might be helpful for folks facing that question? Yes. Um, so most agencies in this area, and, and this has been progressive, I will say, and, and we do have a lot of infections here in New England. And so we are really um, ahead of New York and, and we are really sort of ahead of a lot of other states in this regard. And so everything's been changing week by week. And so I think it's important if you are looking to hire an agency that you understand what's their protocol today and then you call next week or you ask them to put you on a list they have a family list where they send out updates to what they're doing what they should be doing is that every caregiver should be screened um, on a daily basis now some of this is self-screening because they can't go to the office first before they come to you so they ask they ask a lot of these caregivers to take their temperature and to report any symptoms. And in my experience, caregivers have been very good about this. In fact, I've had a lot of caregivers call in to say, uh, my roommate has a fever, so I think I need to quarantine myself. And then that agency should be taking that caregiver off the schedule for two weeks as a precautionary measure. No, I don't think they're testing people routinely. I think you have to be symptomatic unless you're Donald Trump or somebody like that to get a test. Um, so you really, they're not testing people who aren't symptomatic um, because we, as we know, there aren't enough tests to begin with, or at least there weren't, now there are more. 
Um, so I think, uh, and you could test someone the beginning of the week and then they were exposed and they might you know, be symptomatic or have been exposed during that week. So it would have to be a continual testing cycle, which I don't know anyone around here is doing. So it's mostly, I think it's two things. It's making sure that that agency has the PPE, the personal protective equipment, masks and gloves. Everyone here now in New England, every provider has to wear them, their whole shift that they are with people. And so that may be different in your area. You may not have gotten to that point yet where they're requiring that, but you will see it soon. Um, and so you wanna make sure they have that equipment for their caregivers and that their caregivers are being screened somehow and that they have a protocol for when or if the caregiver is taken off the schedule for one reason or another. Um, that's really important and how they know that. So do you have experience with folks now coming into the home using the PPE and the effect that that has on the caregiver and the person with the disease for what had previously been much more routine interaction? Yes. Um, yes. Actually, I've gotten just in the last 24 hours, I've had several questions about this. How do I explain <laughs> to um, my, my partner that these people have to come in with gowns and gloves and masks and it, it, isn't this going to be frightening? And in some cases, yes, it, it can be frightening because it's not what we're used to. I encourage you to try to use a simple explanation. So I've worked with a couple of families to think about using the flu as an example, that this is flu season and that we are trying to reduce the flu as we do every year and that this year the flu is worse, which it is. There's another flu that we're, we're trying to prevent. And so we're, we're all taking precautionary measures um, to make sure uh, that we don't transmit that to one another. So I think if you can equate it to the flu a little bit, that makes more sense and then can be understood. Um, but I think also reassuring um, the person who's being taken care of that they're not ill, that this is not because they're ill, if they're not, um, because I think that could be part of the fear is, are they protecting themselves from me, right? So. Great, thank you. We had a question earlier about what you mentioned in terms of the NSAIDs. Um, and the person is saying that the CDC's website doesn't necessarily say the same prohibition that you're offering. Yep, it's yeah. true. It's can true. You, uh, can you speak to that a little bit, please? Absolutely, yep. Um, what I will say is that while it's not a CDC recommendation, there are a lot of medical professionals across the country making this recommendation. And so I think unless it is essential to your health to take it, then you might, and if it is, if it's essential to you, you might talk to your primary care physician about it. But I am being told by most of the primary care physicians that I am working with here in New England to avoid these things for all of our clients at this point, because there's some evidence, right, that it may exacerbate the symptoms. So I think the message I'm getting is caution is better, avoid it if you can. If you can't, talk with your medical professional about it. Um, you know, there may be some circumstances where it can't be avoided, but in most, in most circumstances, it can be exchanged for Tylenol. Great, thank you. A question when you were talking about staying safe and the role of hand washing. If people are isolating in their homes, and not going out, is hand washing as important? Unfortunately, it is, and I'll tell you why. Um, even if you're isolating in your home, groceries have to get into your home through some um, method, right? Whether you are shopping or someone is bringing things to you. And what we know is that the virus can live on both non porous and porous. Um, surfaces. So it's really important that you not 
touch your face, obviously, um, when you're out in public, but also that you don't touch anything else around you. You would be really surprised. Um, I've even witnessed myself being in a grocery store and seeing people use gloves in the grocery store to pick things up, which makes sense, but then they're using the same gloves to take out their wallet and their keys that they're then later going to touch with their bare hands. So we're human, we're not used to this amount of having to be careful about what we touch. This is just not, some, not a way we have lived in the past. So it's difficult to get used to. And I think, yes, even if you're isolating, it's really important to be washing your hands just to make sure that you don't have anything on your skin that either was brought into your home or you came in contact with that could spread the virus. Great, thanks. And actually that leads nicely into the next question, which is that someone says they've been using a handgun, a heat gun to sanitize service, surfaces or delivered packages. They've heard a that the is deactivated at 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, have you heard anything? Are you aware of the temperatures that should be used if you're trying to sanitize using heat? I did, I did hear this very early on when um, the virus hit here in New England. I did hear rumor of this and I've heard conflicting information. So I've heard some people that say you can kill the virus by heating it up to a certain temperature. And then I've heard other people that say, that's not true, um, that the virus lives in um, lots of different countries and is spread in lots of different countries where the, the um, temperature is much hotter and that there isn't any proof that heating it to that extent um, will kill it. It could be possible, but I haven't heard anything definitive about that. So the guidelines on the CDC site around sanitizing your home and the links that you had mentioned earlier would be a really good reference for people to look yes. to. Yeah. Um, a question about uh, P-O-L-S-T, a post instead of an advanced directive. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah, very good the question. similarities and differences? Yeah. Um, similarities and differences. Well, a post is, or a most, in some places it's called a most, in other places called a post, um, is an advanced directive that is signed with a medical professional. Um, it is a great document. Um, to be used. And one of its advantages is that it travels with you wherever you go. So you sign it in your doctor's office, but then it follows you. If you go to the hospital, if you go to rehab, any of that, it, it follows you. You don't have to be signing a new document, um, which is sometimes true with something like a do not resuscitate or a do not intubate order. So this is an improvement on those specific orders. It's also nice because it gives you lots of different options um, that you can say what you want, or you can say, I'd like my proxy to decide that at the time. So it gives you a lot of options, which is really nice. Um, a living will is a little bit more detail around some people like to talk about where I would like to be when I die. For example, I would like, if possible, I would like to die at home, or if possible, I would like this to happen or that to happen. It gives the opportunity for more detail and um, less medical information, sort of more lifestyle choice kinds of information. So if you have one, I would, I would encourage you to, if you have a pulse, I would encourage you to take a look at the personal directive. And if you feel like the pulse says everything you need it to say, and that you feel confident that you have um, communicated your wishes in writing in that document, that's great. If not, you can always fill out a personal directive, whether it's legally binding or not, in your state, and it will give more information to people that may end up needing to um, make a decision on your behalf. Thanks. We have a couple minutes left, and I'm gonna ask you if you could speak a little bit more to the experiences that you've had with folks who are in facility care. Yes. That's an area of a lot of concern and question for folks now um, around decision-making and facility care um, and the, accessibility of facility care now if you're not in one and may need it, 
So I just wonder if your recent experience has any suggestions that you could leave our folks with. Yes, um, this is a big topic, but I'll try to tackle it in a couple of minutes. Um, and I think here in Massachusetts, the FTD unit um, at Mass General did a presentation just on facility care. Um, and you can find that on their YouTube channel if you're interested in getting a little bit more in-depth information. Um, but what I will tell you is that here in Massachusetts, there are no visits. It is, it is absolutely devastating to a lot of family members to not be able to, to visit even when they're able to do FaceTime because some people are able to do it and other people are not able to do it. Um, and it is, it is excruciating. Here in Massachusetts, we have a lot of facilities. I think we have more facilities than we don't that have active infections. Um, and some of those people have stayed on, on the unit and some of those people have gone out to the hospital. Um, and so I think what's really important is establishing a point person at the facility that you can check in with, scheduling a call with that person, saying, I am going to call you on this day at this time to get an update. And even if they're sending something over email or mail that says, this is what we're doing, this is our protocol, it's your right as a family member to get some detail about what is happening with your loved one that's in a facility. So not only are they symptomatic or not, but is there anyone else on their floor that's symptomatic, a suspected infection or an active infection? And is there a possibility my loved one might need to be moved from their room? Um, and, and what are the new things that the facility is doing to try and um, prevent the spread of the infection. I know a lot of facilities are starting to move residents from one area to another area, so they're really isolating the folks that are symptomatic. Um, so I think working with facilities is difficult at this point. I've had a lot of families just very discouraged. I've had families asking, should they bring their loved one home? Um, and what should they think about in doing that? Um, I can also share, uh, I'll add this to the slides before we share them. Um, I can share a link of a discussion by a care manager like me talking about what are the things you need to think about in bringing someone home. Uh, one of the biggest issues is you may not be able to get them back in. Um, and there's no telling how long that would be. And you would need to make sure you had all the support at home to do that. So I think this is, there's no doubt this is an excruciating time for all of us. Um, and, and even for me, because as a professional, I'm calling on clients that I have in facilities and feeling very frustrated about not getting enough information. Um, I know a lot of people that have done window visits and you have to really, um, you have to balance whether this, is a good idea or a bad idea for, for your particular person um, with FTD, but I know a lot of people that have done it and have had really good experiences waving um, in the windows and holding up signs and things like that. So I think that can be a good way for you um, to interact if possible. Um, if there's a window, you can do that from. And I think really relying on the facility for giving you information and knowing it's your right to have it and you don't need to feel apologetic about asking for that regular check-in. In terms of getting into a facility, this is getting more and more complicated every day. I have several clients right now that are stranded. They were either stranded in the hospital um, or they're stranded in rehab and can't get out, or uh, I have one particular very young client who's 53 with FTD who's living on a locked memory unit right now. He doesn't need to be there, and we're trying to uh, transfer him to a lower level of care, um, but no one's accepting uh, applications right now. So it's a, it's a really challenging time, and if you are struggling, I would encourage you to um, reach out to a care manager like me in your local area that might be able to help you advocate with that particular facility if that's what needs to be done and you feel like you're not getting enough response or you've got a situation where somebody's stuck in a level of care and they need to get out. 
Thank you. It is, it's such a difficult area. And, you know, we, we know that uh, resources are naturally different across the country. And I'm sure some of those differences are heightened and accentuated currently, whether it's around facility care or access to medical specialists that you might need or support. And so um, we are, are really both humbled by the resilience in this community and impressed by the advocacy that goes on and we know how difficult it is for everybody to try to make things work out when your support systems get shifted around and what you think is going to be challenging becomes even more so. Um, yeah, there's just one example I'd like to share because I think this is, is an important point. I have a client who's in, in uh, memory care assisted living. He has FTD and has had some difficulty with behavior in the past. And we found that part of the difficulty is that he really doesn't want females taking care of him. So we brought in private duty um, during personal care time to take care of him. Um, and that has reduced a lot of his anxiety just by having a male person helping him. And the facility just didn't have enough male caregivers. So when this all this virus started to come up, um, one of the things that came up was that the facility said we're no longer allowing private caregivers to come into this facility. And um, I was very concerned that without this private caregiver, he really doesn't like women taking care of him and that he might have some sort of behavior that could land him in the hospital. And that didn't seem fair that they were telling us they needed this care on the one hand and it was required, but yet the minute the virus came up now they can't come in anymore and i said well what's you know i got involved in advocating for this client and i said how can you reassure me that he won't go to the hospital because that's the very worst place for him to be at this time and so we worked on it and we advocated and we did get the facility to give us an exception um and i think so that that's a tale um that advocacy does work and that you need to just be as calm and cool and collected as you can and talk about what are the issues and what are your concerns and how does the facility plan to address those particular issues so we've gotten through quite a bit of that um, by having those kinds of discussions yeah thanks so much and we have kept you over time so okay. i'm going to move us ahead to um to wrap up um and I really do want to thank you for being with us today. We have, I want to um, bring the slides back over this way for a moment. Here we go. Because I want to make sure that in addition to the wonderful tools and suggestions that Jennifer has shared with us today, I want to make sure that people are aware that we will have this recording posted on our website. Um, we have started an additional page to compile the new resources that are coming from AFTD in, an, in a way that people can find them more easily during these challenging times. So we now have a page on our website that's entitled COVID-19 and FTD. You can find this under the Find Help menu on our homepage. And I would remind folks too that our helpline and Facebook groups offer individual information and support, and that we're working with all the AFTD support group volunteers who are working hard to try to offer virtual meetings for their existing groups. Because in addition to the advocacy and the, um, the protection and preparation that Jennifer was talking about, we know that support is an ongoing lifeline for folks. And we really encourage people to think about how AFTD can help you to find and continue with support as well as the other resources that you're connected with already. So again, I really want to thank Dr. Jennifer Pilcher for being with us today. Our special webinar series will continue through the end of April. We have several more sessions coming up. The next one will be on Thursday the 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern time when AFTD volunteer ambassador Corey Sanison, who is also a certified yoga instructor, will lead us on a journey of mindfulness meditation and try to provide some additional suggestions and tips for self-care for people with FTD and their families. So with that, I thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time.